We are now six months into this war. Hezbollah has attacked Israel every single day from October 8th. Hezbollah, inspired by Iran, with Iran, built the eighth largest missile capability in the world. Sorry, Hezbollah has built the eighth largest what? 150,000 rockets. I don't think that people understand how dangerous it is right now in that five to seven kilometer area in the north of Israel. Shalom and welcome to State of a Nation. I'm Elon Levy. Iran's massive direct attack on Israel, over 300 missiles and drones, has raised the specter of regional war. But Iran has already been waging war on Israel through its proxy armies, because it spent decades flooding the Middle East and surrounding Israel with its hired killers, which have been attacking Israel nonstop since October 7th. Hamas in Gaza, of course, the Houthis in Yemen, and Hezbollah in Lebanon. And whether or not Iran wages war on Israel directly, it can still unleash major damage on Israel just through that Lebanese proxy. Because Hezbollah is not a terrorist organization, it's a terrorist army. A terrorist army with a missile stockpile big enough to make most nations' militaries jealous. Hezbollah and Israel are already fighting a low-grade war. Hezbollah entered the war on October 8th, right after Hamas's barbaric atrocities. Since then, it's been shelling northern Israel, raining rockets on the area, displacing tens of thousands of Israelis who can't go back to their homes, homes that are being shelled. Israel is vowing to push Hezbollah away by diplomatic means, preferably, or military means if necessary, so that its people can return home safely. Hezbollah doesn't want to budge, and its attacks have created a no-go zone in northern Israel, cleansed of its residents. And that's not something that Israel can live with. So is a third Lebanon war, funded and guided by Iran, in the offing? Retired Colonel Miri Eisen was the spokeswoman for Israel's Prime Minister's office during the Second Lebanon War in 2006 after a career in military intelligence. She's now the managing director of the International Institute for Counterterrorism at Reichman University in Herzliya. Colonel Eisen has spent years researching and modeling strategies for the scenario that Israel now faces on its northern border. We sit down to talk about what the threat of Hezbollah is, where it came from, how catastrophic a full-scale war in the north would be, and how and whether we can avoid it. Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel was the moment Iran stepped out of the shadows and stopped hiding behind its proxy armies. But that shadow war will keep waging. A shadow war that Iran is hell-bent on continuing, waging war on Israel indirectly, whether or not there ends up being a de-escalation between it and Israel directly. Welcome to the State of a Nation. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage Hundreds taking. of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. Elon. What happens when a four-day course? How do you resolve this? Where does this go? You can't. Why Colonel Eisen, welcome to State of a Nation. Amazing to be here. I can't imagine that I'm sitting really in a seat across from you. <laughs> well, I'm sitting in front of an idol because during the second Lebanon war, we're now potentially on the brink of the third Lebanon war, but during the Second Lebanon War, you were the spokesperson for the Prime Minister's office. Take me down memory lane. What was that like? So it was similar and dissimilar to your times. I was asked to do so immediately after Gilad Shalit was kidnapped. People don't remember that. And then after that, we had the two Israeli soldiers who were kidnapped. I did it for literally three weeks where I had a seven-year-old, five-year-old, and two-year-old at home. So we had vastly different experiences. I was up north most of the time. Not easy times. The world was against us then, too. And you got roped in after the beginning of the war. You were not in place when that war happened. Not at all. So not at all. I some actually, things this country doesn't learn its lessons. It doesn't. In that sense, it's not just about the person who does so. It's about somebody who really understands and knows what they're talking about. You've done amazing work in that sense in the preparation and understanding the material of what you're doing. Today, it's even harder than it was. I can't believe I'm saying this. 
how many years ago? 18 years ago? Unbelievable. I can't imagine the challenges because now it's been so easy to go to Twitter and the WhatsApp groups and refresh and check what the latest news in. But it must have been a whole other kettle of fish to try to make Israel's case when you don't have the instantaneous communications we have now. For a moment, I need to take us back memory lane. You did not have Facebook yet. You did not have smartphones yet. So where were you uploading all your social media clips? What was social media clips? It meant that when you were talking on those international channels that you've been doing, and this you had is to we're fax talking, all of your clips. it wasn't just fax checking. It was a fact checking in that sense. It was <laughs> absolutely you were the what you said is what everybody afterwards quoted. Um, there was no way of getting around it. Um, I don't know what's easier or harder because you also did not have every single person turning into their own news station wherever they are. That's an advantage. And you say the world was against us then as it is now. Back then, you also felt a lack of international legitimacy, even though Israel came under armed attack from Hezbollah. In a very similar way, there was sympathy for the first few days, and then it turned, and I know the turning point. I was also a spokesperson alone in uniform in the second intifada. And there also I can talk about the fact that we were winning battles and losing the international branding war already in 2002 three, so it's a long way back. What was the turning point in the Second Lebanon War? In the Second Lebanon War, it was two different things. One was when we made a mistake, and the mistake is that we shelled an area and we killed 100 uninvolved citizens. That was a big turning point. That was four days into the war. But the second aspect was when all of the people in Lebanon who felt that they were under danger decided to leave. And the British left and the French left and on British TV, you would be following a lovely young woman with four kids under the age of six. And it was a personal story, and it was all about her and not about the reason for the war itself. So that was the second Lebanon war. We're now potentially on the brink of a third Lebanon war and a full-scale war erupting between Israel and Hezbollah. It's already been a low-grade war for the last six months. Hezbollah shelling northern Israel, firing thousands of rockets, forcing tens of thousands of people to flee their home. But we're potentially on the brink of something much larger and catastrophic. How likely do you think that is at this point of a full-scale war between Israel and Hezbollah this side of New Year's? So here we are, and we are in a multi-front war. With Hezbollah right now, we're already, as you said, fighting, but in a limited area. A full-scale war, because we're already in a limited war, means that sitting in the greater Tel Aviv area will not feel comfortable. Hezbollah has a vast array of projectiles that can reach the center of the country. Hezbollah has capabilities both against the Israeli Air Force in the sky, and they have managed every once in a long while to down a UAV, but they also have capabilities to be able to mass attack in such a way that it may take out electricity inside Israel, a lot of the different infrastructure and air force capabilities and bases. We didn't see any of that from Hamas. So we're talking about something that we will feel much more throughout Israel in a very harsh way. And I wanna drill into what such a scenario would look like. And it's terrifying to think of, but how likely do you think it is at this point? Is this? a foregone conclusion that it will happen, and it's a question of when, not if, or is this something that can still be forestalled? It can always be forestalled because at the end, it's always about decision-making. It's about choices. Now, I give you the following choice. You can make a deal with the devil, because you have to make the deal with Hezbollah. You have to believe that deal with the devil, that they will move the forces that they have very near the Israeli border. They're in Lebanon. They're part of Lebanon who's going to supervise their moving, who's going to be sure that they really have moved. And then you promise the Israeli citizens to go back to the dozens of Israeli communities that were preemptively evacuated. You tell people like you and like me, go back to your homes. It's safe. You're secure. Okay, that's you make that deal or you don't make that deal. You don't believe them. And that means that you initiate a full scale war, which will impact both the people up north and the people in the center. And I give you the lovely, I'm being very sarcastic, the harsh options that are on the table right now. So I don't think it's inevitable, but I think that either choice is very difficult. And we are in the middle of the Israeli leadership having to decide. And by the way, if they don't decide between the two choices, that's also making a choice. 
I'll ask a third time, and if you don't want to put a percentage figure on it, you don't have to. But if you were a betting woman, mm -hmm. how likely is this war? I think that the war is likely. I don't see a situation right now that Israel believes Hezbollah. I do think that Hezbollah has an interest in not opening a war. So I can't say I don't want to do a double negative. I'm going to do the positive. I actually think that it's above 30%, which is very high when we're talking about war, which means we need to prepare ourselves. But if I'm saying only 30%, there's 70% that says we can arrive at a different kind of resolution in its own way. It's delaying a war to later, but that's okay with me. So I want to take a zoom out and understand how we got to this situation that we've had a low-grade war with Hezbollah for six months, potentially on the brink of a much larger scale war. You say 30%, it's high, it means it can still be avoided. What has been happening on Israel's northern border since October 7th? Because so much of international attention has been focused on Gaza, on the war in Gaza. The northern front in Israel has been a distraction, a headline here or there. Take us through what has been happening in northern Israel on the Lebanese border since Hamas started the October 7th massacre in the south. On October 8th, Hezbollah declared war against Israel, just like Hamas declared war on Israel on October 7th. We are now six months into this war. Hezbollah has attacked Israel every single day from October 8th. We don't hear about it every single day. They have used an immense variety of weaponry against Israel, much more sophisticated than what Hamas has, only they've done it in a limited arena. What Hezbollah says is that they're doing so to support the Palestinian cause. What they de facto have done is they have created what is in the end of the day pretty much a buffer zone inside Israel from between five to seven kilometers, it depends where, near the border, the entire city of Kiryat Shmona, a city of 24,000 people, were preemptively evacuated. They live in 220 hotels inside Israel. Everybody goes, ooh, hotels. I'm like, do you want to be... It's from the first week the government puts you up in a hotel, maybe the second week, not the third when you have kids and they need to go back to school. And they need to go back to school. And you also, you want, this is about people having jobs, having lives, going to schools, having day-to-day -day lives. And they don't live in a hotel. They live in the state of Israel. They cannot go back right now, right now alone. I don't think that people understand how dangerous it is right now in that five to seven kilometer area in the north of Israel. Hezbollah fires in suicide drones. They fire in anti-tank guided missiles that are very exact, the kind that have an eye that can really see the target. And then they also show videos of them firing that. They fire against every single one of the communities there and they are proud of what they do. Not that I'm telling people to do so, but I every single day go into the El Manal Hezbollah website. They are very proud of what they do. They present there the hundreds, thousands of attacks that they've done. They show them. They say that they're against what they'll call the Israeli settlements. And they state very clearly with infographs in English that what they want to do is destroy Israel. They don't say it in a different way. They don't say that this is about supporting the Palestinians. They say this is about destroying Israel. And they've done it from October 8th every single day in a variety of ways, both against military targets, civilian targets, into cities, into towns, into agricultural areas. I could go on and on, and they will continue to do so. They have the capabilities, and the only word I haven't said until now to give a broader sense is that all of their capabilities come from the one and only Islamic regime of Iran. And we'll get to that in a second, but I want to understand what is happening on the northern border, because for so many people it has seemed like a distraction or a sideshow. Hezbollah declares war on October 8th. It fires suicide drones, anti-tank missiles at people's homes, at vehicles inside northern Israel forcing a whole buffer zone to evacuate. People are up in hotels and guest houses. And what level of destruction have we seen to those villages and kibbutzim along northern Israel? And how far have they been firing rockets into Israel in this low-grade war? So in the direct firing, they're firing five to seven kilometers in. Let's be exact. The town of Metula, a town of a few thousand people, literally over a thousand buildings have been Destroyed. A thousand buildings have been Inside, destroyed. you have to go to be able to see. It means it's going to be fired into, and these are people's homes. When you go into the city of Kiryat Shmone, a city of 24,000 people, you have tall buildings, short buildings, homes, um, schools, etc. Nobody lives there. Nobody has lived there for the last six months. So when I say nobody's lived there, some of the, um, uh, their factories, do you close down everything? Factories worked. People have been killed inside these places. 
People have gone into the fields, into the agricultural fields, Neil, because we have kibbutzi, moshavi, there are apples and cherries and all sorts of different things. They have been killed in the fields. So we're not talking about a very large amount of Israeli casualties. Um, and we'll get to that in a moment. Israel has responded. This isn't, we're not only that, we're preempting now. So what have, what have we been doing? What has Israel been doing to fend off this threat? So first of all, we immediately respond to any firing into Israel. That means that if I'm sitting, you're firing against me and I know you just fired, I fire and I kill you. And I say that because Israel until now, in the last um, six months, has killed 270 Hezbollah fighters. That is an enormous number. An enormous number. We don't know the exact numbers when it comes out of Hamas and the Gaza Strip because they hide it. Hezbollah have had put out a photograph of every single one of the fighters that's killed. They have been killed in southern Lebanon and in northern Lebanon, but that's an ongoing fight. In addition, Israel is preemptive. So retaliation is one thing. Retaliation, preemptive against caches of weapons where you have both the capability where they're putting together some of these weaponry, where they have the guided missiles, where they put together both the projectiles themselves, the suicide um, drones, as I said. These are different factories that are usually not near the south. They're not on the border. They're further north. And we attack up north. Um, I'm sorry, when you say suicide drones, for people who think that's science fiction, what is a suicide drone? It is a drone that you send off with a payload. And it, bomb, what it, essentially. I think that what most people think of, and excuse me right now, I'm not saying this against the Japanese, the, the Japanese pilot. bomb, Ka kamikaze, kamikaze pilots. pilots. Only it's without a pilot. Right. It's just the physical drone. And when I say drones, some of them, I like to say this, it's not nice. They're small and cute, right? They're the ones that you would have um, at a birthday party where you want to take or what people have at home. As small so, as that. Totally. The ones that you can buy, you know, off of Amazon on the market or the much large, larger scale ones that are made mainly inside the Iranian... Brings a AliExpress. Oh, it does. What you can bring into... Well, that's also what they did inside the Gaza Strip, but that's an additional aspect. But here we're talking about thousands and even tens of thousands so that Hezbollah could right now send in at the same time, when you talk about the threat, 1,000 drones that each have a payload. We're really good in our defense. We will down 95%. Did you just do the math? You down 950 out of 1,000, 50 get through. Where do those payloads go? The bulk of these type of suicide drones will have a GPS type of system that means that they can explode on or in the anti-aircraft capabilities into military bases. That's going to be one kind of target into cities, into towns, into the infrastructure. That's what Hezbollah wants to do. Real challenges that are out there. I want in a moment to try to look at the threat that we are facing specifically from Hezbollah, potentially in an upcoming war. But first, let's take a step back and understand how we even got to the situation where a terrorist army is in control of neighboring territory on Israel's border. It's something we take for granted in Israel that territory on our borders will be controlled by terrorist armies. What is Hezbollah doing there? How did he get there? Hezbollah was established at the beginning when Israel was in Lebanon because of Palestinian terror organizations. And Hezbollah is a Lebanese, Arabic-speaking, local Shiite force. It is completely inspired by the Islamic revolution in Iran. Why is that so important? Because it was the local Lebanese Shiites who said, hey, look at what the Shiites, Persian-speaking, in Iran did. Maybe we can do that here in Lebanon. Lebanon is a very different country. But in that sense, what we're talking about is local Lebanese that are part of the society. The Shiites themselves were the bottom of the totem pole when it came to Lebanese politics and capabilities. And Hezbollah, inspired by Iran, with Iran, over the last 40 years in stages, have built what is the eighth largest weaponry of projectiles in the world. The eighth largest in the world. Where those, that capability was built up. Sorry, Hezbollah has built the eighth largest what? It's what because it's that they have the eighth largest missile capability in the world. I Meaning you As have like the you, you have Russia. Yes, you have Russia. You have the United States. You know, you have China. You get some smaller countries, and then eighth the is eighth Hezbollah. largest missile stockpile in the world. One hundred and fifty thousand rockets. I'm only talking which, about the rockets, which they have built up since when? They've built them up. So the initial portion was done before Israel ever left Lebanon. And when we were in Lebanon, they, were much, they, Hezbollah, were much more focused on doing 
what we call, I hate this term, you know, classic terror attacks, which is going to be with IEDs, with side bombs, blowing up soldiers inside Lebanon. In 2000, 24 years ago, Israel, with its troop, left Lebanon. And Hezbollah, both as a Lebanese force and as an Iranian, again, the Islamic regime of Iran, foothold in the north of, or in the south of Lebanon, north of Israel, started to stockpile weapons. And that's part of the backdrop of the 2006 Second Lebanon War. But then there is this war in 2006. Israel goes head to head with Hezbollah for over a month. It's a devastating war. That war ends with a UN Security Council Resolution 1701 that is supposed to keep Hezbollah north of the Litani River, away from Israel's border, with a UN peacekeeping force in southern Lebanon. So how did Hezbollah, it's not a terrorist group, it's a full-fledged army, manage to build the eighth the largest weapons missile stockpile in the world on Israel's border when the UN has a piece of paper saying it's not supposed to be there? The United Nations interim force in Lebanon is defined as a peacekeeping force. And I'm not against the United Nations definitions, but we always have to look at it in a broad sense. They're there to keep the peace. Part of what happened in 1701 is that they said, okay, they can also disarm those who are not allowed to have weaponry. But they're supposed to do that together with the Lebanese army. And in the mandate of 1701, I'm becoming very specific in that sense, it says that they can do so in open spaces, not inside the urban areas. Mm. Remember where we started? Hezbollah are Lebanese, Arabic-speaking Shiites, mainly in the south of Lebanon, also with a very strong presence inside the city of Beirut, and in addition, in the Beka Valley, which is in the northeast on the border with Syria. Those are the three areas where the Shiites mainly reside. They're Lebanese. Hezbollah went into politics. My favorite issue, okay? A terrorist organization, terrorist army, that goes into politics is a terror organization that goes into politics. They use their terror tactics in the political arena. But when you go into the political arena, you get legitimacy. So they've been playing those two different places for many, many years. They went into the politics already from the early 2000s. After 2006, they actually expanded it. So they're both a political player inside Lebanon. Remember, the Lebanese army has to go together with Unifil to do things, and Hezbollah is part of that arena. And so is that essentially then how Hezbollah has been able to establish that foothold in southern Lebanon with the eighth largest missile stockpile in the world? Because essentially it has parasitically, what, taken over the Lebanese state that is supposed to be acting against it under the resolution? Am I understanding that right? But it's not a parasite. That's why it's so challenging. It is part of the Lebanese arena. These are real Lebanese Shiites. The issue is that from 2006, when all of us were very focused on Hezbollah's military capability, the urban renovation, the civilian reconstruction of Lebanon post-2006 was mainly done with Iranian money, which means that at the end, Mrs. Muhammad whatever, who lives in her town or village, she knows that the clinic, that the house, that the school was rebuilt by Iranian money, and that means that when the Iranians also send in a little bit of a missiles and I come in and say, hey, can I use your garage? You know, I just want to put something inside there. Can I use that underground storage area that you have under the garage, under the mosque, under the hospital in a very similar way to the big challenge that we have that Hamas did inside the Gaza Strip? Hezbollah has done under over 200 Shiite villages just in the south of Lebanon, add into that Beirut and the Beka Valley. And that's the, the best way that I've heard the situation described is that it's impossible to dislodge Hezbollah from the villages because they are the villages now. Is that assessment correct? Absolutely. And in its own way, I say, because that's not our subject of the day, that we all have to remember that it's a very similar challenge when it comes to Hamas in the Gaza Strip. I'll add in, just to make us even more uncomfortable, that... Please, tunnel... I'm not fidgeting in my exactly. seat enough. Exactly. Is that tunneling is not something that Hamas invented. By the way, it's not something that Hezbollah invented. But underneath these hundreds of Shiite villages, that idea of having underground subterranean arenas where you have the command and control, the weapons, the launchers, the different capabilities, and the capability to go underground, that's under dozens, if not hundreds, of these different communities. And they built attack tunnels into Israel 
hey, I loan you an I. I mean, I many times have had this to go with different influentials into the tunnels that Israel exposed at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. There was a whole exposure. So you go on the one hand, we There was exposed. a period when we were afraid it could actually trigger an all-out war when Israel went in to destroy those attack tunnels. Do we think that there are still tunnels under the border from Lebanon into Israel? Wouldn't you think that today it's better to assume that there is than isn't? Okay, I'm just saying in that sense that I think that what October 7th in that sense did to all of us is we said, wow, we thought we had a handle on things, and I would say we did not. I'm not going to talk about the South, but that most definitely means that you look at that northern threat and go, wow, I saw the northern threat, and I thought that I had done all of the tunnels. Let's act as if maybe they'll still be able to surprise us, both by attack tunnels, but for sure they have the subterranean arena under their towns and villages that means that they fire the rocket, and when I retaliate, when I destroy the rocket, I'm destroying the mosque or the school or the medical clinic or somebody's home. This isn't military bases, and in that, it's very similar to what happens within the Gaza Strip. And that's the expectation. When we look at that next war, it's going to have that horrific, I don't even want to use the term humanitarian, okay? That urban attack, because that is where Hezbollah is deployed. That's how they built their structure. So what capabilities has Hezbollah built in sub southern Lebanon? We're talking about 150,000 rockets, tunnels underneath hundreds of villages. What else? What military force is waiting for us on the northern border? So the most infamous or famous terrorist in the world is a man who went into other worlds. Um, his name was Imad Mournia. And his, he was the second to the secretary general of Hezbollah, to Hassan Nasrallah. Imad Mournia was killed by a car bomb at the heart of Damascus in 2008. Hezbollah, of course, blamed us. If we did that, good on us. But that's just me with you saying here. His code name was Radwan. And the Radwan force that was established in his honor, in his name, is what I would call the Commando Hezbollah Force. It's based on the people who live in the South. It's based on people who are both the farmers or full-time warriors, because they're a terror army. Who teaches them? The Iranian Al-Quds and the Iranian, in that sense, it's the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, who both have people deployed in Lebanon to teach and in Syria, or in Iran itself. And they're being trained to do what? They're being force? trained to do, everybody have in their eyes the vision, I'm gonna be very visual. You see the motorcycles, you see the pickup trucks, you see them coming into the communities and everybody's looking right now at those pictures from October 7th. Hezbollah Rodwan forces have been training to do that kind of attack for over five years. They're very proud of it. They would show it. There are lots of uploaded videos of them doing that kind of thing. And you go, you saw it so clearly up north, and then it happened from Hamas down south. So yes, all of the elements that we saw on October 7th, we have seen the Rajwan forces, thousands of fighters, similar to Nukba in that sense, to Hamas down south, training to go into Israeli towns, villages, military bases, to kill, to pillage, to destroy. Not don't, these days, I should say hostages, because that was one of the elements that I don't think we understood as clearly at the time. Um, and they also have way more firepower to be able to come in, both with UAVs above ground, below ground, and to be able to do that and kind of ground that attack. How many men are we talking about in the Hezbollah terrorist army? So in the Radwan forces, we were talking about at least 5,000. In Hezbollah terror forces, I would say tens of thousands. I don't know a better exact number. Hezbollah participated in a very active way in the Syrian war to help Bashar Assad. It was the first foreign force, if I can call that, as a Lebanese force, that came to help Bashar Assad at the end of 2011. That seems a really long time ago. But it means that Hezbollah fighters from Lebanon came into Syria, and for five, six, seven years, they were in active combat in urban areas, helping out the different Syrian, again, pro-Bashar, tens of thousands. They, at the time, acknowledged that a thousand terror soldiers were killed in Syria. A thousand. I would say that they have at the least 30,000 fighters that are trained. And again, it's based inside the population. Um, there hasn't actually been a demographic census in the country called Lebanon since 1932. It's a very sensitive subject there with the different denominations. But assuming that literally almost half of the population is Shiite, 
the potential there in that sense is that the Shiites there are certainly three, if not four million people. And just like you have two, you know, 2.3 million people in the Gaza Strip, how many of them, of the young men, joined Hamas? I do those numbers up north and I get to 30 to 40,000. And in terms of the rockets, we're talking about how heavy are these rockets? How far can they go? How precision guided are they? So it's a combination of all of the above. It means that- Those were questions. They were. Statistics themselves. They have tens of thousands of the short range, what we call statistic. When I say short range, I'm not talking 10 kilometers. I'm talking short range, 30 to 50 kilometers. 30 to 50 kilometers Which, which takes you all the way to range. Haifa. Yeah, that's the ones that they have, which take you to Haifa and Tiberias, okay? When you get into the mid and long range, we're talking about tens of thousands. These are things that have been de deployed. All of the above are what I call statistic. What they have been, statistic meaning they're not with a guidance system that will bring them to literally within 30 to 40 meters of where they want to fire it. They fire it and say, I'm firing it at the electrical plant and it, you know, is in the town next door and that was where they were firing at. Nowadays, we're already talking about the upgrade, which is putting into the warhead of these different systems, both ones that can go four to 500 kilometers, four to 500 kilometers. That's twice the length of Israel. That's twice the length of Israel, but what it means is that they can fire it from northern Lebanon into the south of Israel. Or they can, okay, they, they can go Sirens over. can go off in Eilat and they won't know if Absolutely. it's Hezbollah or the Houthis. Absolutely. That's where we are nowadays. I'll share with you on a very personal note. Please. October 7th, 6, 29 a.m. Siren goes off. My husband and I were both retired colonels. We thought it was Hezbollah. <laughs> because you don't know where the, where the rockets are coming from. No, because we, we need were, different sirens telling us if it's from the north or the south or the but east we or the were west. Waiting, we were waiting for the attack from the north. So we're talking about precision guided missiles. How heavy are these Payload. warheads? So the warheads are way heavier than what we've seen from Hamas. I say way heavier. Um, we're talking about half a ton, a ton. These are things that we haven't seen. And the missiles coming from Gaza have been with what payloads? 50 kilo, 100 kilo. So we're talking 10 times. Kilo, 10, 10 times. 10, 20 Everything times. Everything is 10, 20 times, which is why the impact is going to be so much more, meaning they can fire um, not just 5,000 rockets in a day. They can do that, just do the math, okay? For 20 days, 5,000 rockets a day. How many interceptors do we have? We don't talk about those exact numbers. They have them from a variety of ranges. We have interceptors for a variety of ranges. They also have a lot of surface-to-air missiles, which are against both our UAVs, our unmanned aerial vehicles, and our manned pilots. I'm not saying until now, I always want to kind of touch on wood, okay? We're, we're very good, we understand, we have evasive tactics. But at the end, I say this harshly, it's about statistics, okay? Because in that multi-front war, when it goes to real scale, or a high scale, high intensity, we're not gonna have electricity for days because of the way that they can do both guided missiles and knock it out, and they wanna make that impact. Um, it's going to, hurt the Israeli Air Force in a way that we did not see at all in the fight against Hamas in the South. And we've also been lucky. You need a little bit, but I don't think of it as luck. I call it about professionalism. Um, and add into that that the center of Israel does not have the kind of defensive systems um, within our homes and everything like that that you do have more along Israeli borders. So this might be a <laughs> stupid question, but, but I have to ask it, why? I mean, why has Hezbollah built up this fearsome arsenal, monstrously expensive? What is its interest? What does it want from us? And don't tell me just they hate Jews. I mean, it's the truth, but it's a very simplistic answer. Like, what is Hezbollah's strategic interest here? Why would they invest so much money in building this fearsome war? I actually think of this as probably the most important question, not as a stupid question. Sometimes stupid questions are the most important ones. They absolutely are, Elon. And here I'm just going to say the very clear-cut answer. Hezbollah did not build anything. Hezbollah was supplied everything from the Islamic regime of Iran. And here we have to look at it and do that zoom out. All of Hezbollah's capabilities have come from the Islamic regime. Why did the Islamic regime of Iran, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, the Al-Quds Force, because that's kind of the hierarchy of how it came on and in, why did they give these? Why are they training them? Why are they supplying them with the state-of-the-art weaponry that they have? For Iran, 
Hezbollah on our border is both the one that pokes us, the one that gives a response, but essentially Hezbollah is Iran's deterrence against Israel attacking Iranian in Iran. Do you see Hezbollah then as a proxy in the sense of a puppet on a string where Iran presses a button and Hezbollah will jump when ordered? Or, or does it have its own strategic interests and a certain degree of autonomy and independence from its Iranian warlord patrons? So the question as you posed it in that sense is really at the heart of assessment. I don't know. There are those who think that it's absolutely a proxy, that the reason until now it has not expanded beyond the five to seven kilometers, has not used its full capabilities, is because Iran is saying, no, 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 don't use them, just in case, don't use them. We didn't give them to you right now just to destroy Israel right now. That's not the capability. The other side of the equation would be, is, and I say it as a question, is the Hezbollah Shiite Arabic-speaking Lebanese, are they part of Lebanon? Are they worried that Israel would both retaliate against the people? Because at the end, when you retaliate, you're not targeting the people, but these weapons, these capabilities are in the homes, are in the hospitals, are in the mosques. As we see with the Hamas down south, we're going to retaliate and destroy those. And that means that we will be destroying portions both of southern and central or northern Lebanon. That's already happening right now. You have evacuees in Lebanon who are saying, why do we have 60, 70, 80,000 Lebanese who have left? So the question is on the table. I don't have an answer. I don't think that we all have to have answers for because everything. Because I'm trying to understand Hezbollah's interest. Israel and Lebanon don't have a territorial dispute apart from a very small area of farmland that is a residual issue. Hezbollah entered this war on October 8th, claiming to be intervening on the side of the Palestinians. Let's take a listen to a little clip from Hassan Nasrallah speaking um, just around a month after the war started. Let's hear how he justifies his decision to enter the war. The pain and suffering of the Palestinian people is not a secret to the whole world. And there is no point to delve in this. Yet the recent years were harsh, especially with this radical, stupid, and brutal government of Israel. Is this rhetoric and bluster coming from Hassan Nasrallah that he's standing up for the Palestinians against the brutal government of Israel? Or, or what's going on here? If we would put on now Iranians' supreme leader, Khamenei, he'd say similar things. He tweets them out pretty much every single day. In this case, I feel like I'm listening to the little Iranian Persian guy, not the Lebanese. And that Iran, the Islamic regime of Iran, the Persian speaking, but Islamic regime of Iran, call for our destruction, call Israel the cancer of the world, call Zionism the worst thing in the world. And perhaps in its own worst way, the worst part for me right now is how the world is echoing Khamenei and Nasrallah, and they've kind of forgot their decent place in the world. It's like, do you listen to them at all? Hezbollah very much calls for our destruction. And I think that in that sense, it is echoing the Islamic revolution of Iran, much more than the country called Lebanon. Sorry, when you say calling for Israel's destruction, you mean Hezbollah's statements are not about liberating the Sheba farms, the little land dispute there is in the north, or about standing up for the plucky little Gazans in, in, in Gaza against Israel. It's about the destruction of the state of Israel. As it simple is, as that. It's not just as simple as that. Go into their website or not. El Manar, you may be followed afterwards by all sorts of different intelligence. Okay. El Manar. Okay. Okay. I, it's I, will, in English. I will stay away from Hezbollah.com. Hey, I go into it all the time. It's El Manar. It is their official website. And they have it there as an infograph, Elon. And it says, the aim is the destruction of the Zionist entity. That would be us. It states very clearly. So let's have a look then about what will happen if an all-out war erupts, or rather not erupts, if the low-grade war that is happening mm -hmm. now that has seen so many internally displaced people on Israel's side spirals into a full-scale war. What sort of scenario are we looking at? We're looking at thousands of rockets and UAVs and suicide drones a day, pretty much for a week or two. After that, it has to drop off just because it's not that we're sitting here like sitting ducks, meaning we in the meantime in Israel are 
both defending by intercepting those incomings. That's a lot of different types of projectiles. How many of those do you think are going to be intercepted? How many are going to get through? Um, 90 to 95% will be intercepted. But how it's many all about do you statistics. expect they'll be firing a day? I think that they will be firing such a degree that if 50 to 100 a day will get through, that's a lot. So you that's, think they're going to be firing 1,000 rockets at Israel a day? I think that they're going to be firing more in the first week or two. After that, it'll go down. Again, similar to Hamas, they'll use it because they want to make sure that they have all the way to the end. They have to show that they can keep on firing. And the pattern will be indiscriminate fire at Israeli cities, trying to specifically target critical infrastructure. What do we think Hezbollah's strategy is? They want to do the critical infrastructure because they want to show that they are doing warfare. And they will be attacking all of Israel because they don't do warfare. They're a terror organization. They're going to say they're doing it against the military. They will try to target the military because they understand that the military very much threatens them. We also understand that. So here it comes into the defense, and I'm posing it as a question for all of us right now. We think of Iron Dome as an idea, okay, because we have a lot of different types there. Where should Iron Dome be? Should it be defending you and me as citizens, or should it be defending the military bases? Just think of the moral dilemma there, because if it isn't defending the military bases, we won't have the military to defend us. But if it's defending the military bases, it's not going to be defending all of the citizens of Israel. We don't have that kind of hermetic um, shield. And what about this iron beam technology that's been tested using a laser at a fraction of the cost of iron dome interceptors to blow rockets out of the sky? Could, could that be in place in time for a war with Hezbollah? I don't think so. Not if it's going to take place right now. Having said that, I always wonder at what stage you use something meaning that they've already shown operational idea, meaning it is something that will be deployed. But I don't want to tell you if that's this year or next year or another 10 years. It's a question. Let's put this on the table. Third Lebanon war, how catastrophic would this be? How many casualties should we expect to see? How many buildings, iconic buildings, can we expect to be destroyed by Iranian-made missiles? At the institute that I now have the honor to be the director of, they did a kind of scenario like this in the last three years. And the numbers that we arrived at won't make anybody happy. We're talking about between, wow, everybody's going to be uncomfortable right now, okay? Um, two to 500 casualties a day for the first week. Two to 500 casualties a day for the first week? Yeah, afterwards it goes down. I know. Nobody wants to talk about that because we're talking, if I say that 50 to 100 get through, um, I can't assess in that sense if it's going to be the ones that will specifically have the heavy payload. That's a lot of, again, it's about both destruction and about death. Um, and that's one of the aspects of how prepared are we? I think that a lot of systems in Israel are way more prepared now than they were six months ago. The health system for sure but not just the health system. I think one of the good things that's happened inside Israel in these six months of the war against Hamas, not against the Gaza Strip, against Hamas and the Gaza Strip has been the preparation of local authorities who understand that there probably won't be electricity. When you don't have electricity, that means you don't have pumping water. You don't, it, it isn't just the refrigerator per se, okay? It's not just your phone. It's, it's not just no Wi-Fi. Okay? That's also part of it because it means you don't know what's happening. We're not at that stage yet, but that's part of those day-to-day -day preparations. And as I say to people, be prepared at a low level. One of the things that will happen is I think that the electricity, and here we're already talking that the electrical authorities in Israel, we have a lot of alternatives. So well, they'll attack one, you go to the other. You de but you have to be aware of the fact that that's going to be part of what happens. And we're not used to that here. That has not happened here. Um, there's a whole aspect that has to do with cyber warfare that the Iranians could be bring in. And again, for me, any full scale against Hezbollah means the Iranians are in. That Islamic regime, the cyber capabilities sit more in Iran than they do in Lebanon, but they can have an impact here too. Um, and we're going to be seeing that as well, so that I would say it's about a week of very uncomfortable with the amount of casualties. Having said that, it's not that we're paralyzed. It's just that it's going to be way more casualties and destruction than we've ever seen. But how prepared is the Israeli home front in terms of buildings that are fortified? How effective are people's home rocket shelters going to be? The Miklatim, the rocket shelters on the ground floor or the basement. I mean, if someone is in Tel Aviv and they go into the rocket shelter that is at the car park level, mm -hmm. are they going to be safe? 
way safer than they're, if they're outside. As I always, I mean, I, I become very, you know, you kind of become less affair in these sort of things where it's like, if it hits you direct, it hits you direct. But if it doesn't hit you direct, if you are inside any kind of shelter, you are 100% in a better situation than otherwise. That doesn't mean that you won't be hurt, but it does mean you're saving lives in a complete way. And I think we also saw that in the first months here where people acted responsibly and there were very few, not even killed, injured, because people were responsible and they should continue to be so. Doesn't and matter so the taking payload. taking personal responsibility. Of course, we don't want to encourage anyone or the public to panic, but what sensible steps should households in Israel be taking given the possibility of such a war erupting? It's no different from what was said here at the beginning of the main attack of Hamas against Israel. Have water around, because you may not have water in the beginning. As I said, electricity will definitely go out. Um, and I joke about it. I really do think in today's day and age, the one thing we all should be going to buy is a radio that has batteries. Because the biggest challenge will be for all of us is we all live in the information age. And you'll be able to continue to hear if you have a radio with a battery. I don't know how long your phone is going to last. And again, how that kind of wave will work. All of the different municipalities in Israel have been working on the local radio, you know, the kind of waves that don't go away. And that's going to be, you know, the contact at the beginning. I think a lot of other systems won't be working again, not forever, but a day or two. Have water um, and a radio with batteries. So in the scenario you're describing of Hezbollah launching over a thousand rockets at Israel a day, many precision guided, many with a heavy payload, 200, 500 casualties a day. What sort of Israeli response can we expect? What will Israel's strategy be? to try to eliminate this immediate threat of ongoing mass casualty events? What will Israel try to do in such a war? So even now in the early stages, what we're seeing is Israel attacking the sites themselves where you have large um, cache of weapons, where you have a lot of the different rockets. You're gonna try and go find what I call the ones that you know have the heavy payloads because it isn't the same kind of launcher. That has to do with years of intelligence gathering, very specific, where you're trying to make sure that you take out the ones that really threaten all the things that I'm talking about. So taking out rocket launchers? It's not just, it's ro rocket launchers. It's the UAVs. It's the capabilities. I can see us doing a lot of the defense that we've seen a bit over the last week or so in that sense, where you're trying to distort the incoming in a variety of ways so that they're not going to be exact in the way that they think they are going to be. Um, and everything is effective up to a point. Um, in military terms, and it's the worst part that people hate when I say, there is no such thing ever of 100%. Something's always going to get through. You don't want to be the one there when that something gets through. And that's why you want to be prepared. Water, radio, you know, calmness. <laughs> At the end of the day, the best case scenario that we could expect as a result of such a catastrophic war and at horrendous cost is to push Hezbollah north of the Litani River and push it out of southern Lebanon. And therefore, Israel has been giving a, an opportunity for diplomatic talks, saying, we want to resolve this by diplomatic means. The window is closing. We have a duty as a state to get people back to their homes. Mm -hmm. But we would rather have internationally mediated talks to push Hezbollah back to where it should be, beyond the Litani River. And there have been talks with the Americans and the French. Do you see a prospect for success there and pushing Hezbollah away? Is there enough pressure inside Lebanon from people who understand the destruction that Hezbollah could bring on them? Do the Americans and the French have leverage? Or is this just going through the motions to say we exhausted the diplomatic option? I think that after we just described the horrific kind of war that will take place, you're going to try to make sure it doesn't take place, meaning you're going to give the diplomatic option real serious thought. Of course. These aren't good options. The war is not a good option. Not having the war. Knows, no, but if Hezbollah knows that war is going to be destructive for it as well, surely it should want to back off so it doesn't have to get pushed away at enormous cost. And, and at that stage along the way, it's always going to be the question, so if they do back away, for how long is that? Does it mean that they actually still have all of the capabilities that we just described? They're just not using it. Um, I'm still going to feel a little uncomfortable having said that. Those are the options on the table. The terror armies that have grown here over the last 10, 15 years, Hezbollah from A to Z overwhelmingly supplied, trained, 
and thought of by the Iranian um, um, Islamic regime. But Hamas in its smaller way, because it's not as threatening, and yet look at what it's doing right now. These type of terror regimes, what they really, what scares me in that sense is that you arrive at a diplomatic resolution because you don't want to have that all-out war on either side, and yet the threat stays and there. And therefore the horrific question, since Israel has been saying every day that Hezbollah remains on our northern border as a threat of a much bigger October 7th. If hostages get taken, they're in Iran by the afternoon. We understand what the threat is there. This sounds awful, but we're, we're talking geopolitics now. Does Israel have an interest in getting this over with and saying, look, a war with Hezbollah is inevitable. It will come sooner or later. So let's seize the window of opportunity while the military has been called up and people have been evacuated anyway rather than finding ourselves in the same situation in two years, because you still have an Iranian proxy terrorist army with the eighth largest missile stockpile in the world, miles away from people's homes. So at the end of the day, you have to take into account two things. Do you want to preempt? And then you know you're starting it. But because you preempt and, and war becomes a 100% certainty. And absolutely. You don't and in the preemption, it doesn't mean that you're destroying everything, okay? You are choosing your time, your place, and you think that you have good intelligence and you know what you're doing, but you know up front that they also are trying to defend themselves. And the question in this case really is, how do we feel as Israel, not just with a multi-front war, but one that is going to be very destructive, it's going to have a lot of casualties, and you're opening up the full-scale front with Iran, and here I'm going to bring into the room the elephant that nobody wants to talk about right now, which is, do you do all of that when Israel is literally at its most isolated point? I almost, I don't want to say in history. As I said, I, I, I always, I've been in this game for a long time. It's very bad right now, and it's been very bad in the past in different ways. But I put it as a question. How about you delay it, okay? Because right now, nobody in the world looks at Israel and says that we have the right to preempt, meaning you do it because you understand what a threat it is. Nobody understands it that way, because it will be attacking in the country called Lebanon, not a quasi-state called Hamas in the Gaza Strip. The country called Lebanon that has diplomatic strong ties, both with the French and with the United States. That's not a little thing that you do there, that you go and preempt. And the fear then is that one of the biggest dangers of allowing the October 7th war against Hamas to segue into a broader conflict against Hezbollah, apart from the obvious risks and dangers of such a war would be that Israel would essentially begin the war with zero international sympathy. We have been, <clears throat> we're at a low place when it comes to Israel's international standard. I just want to tell you, it can go lower, but that's just me again with my- Oh, that's Jewish history teaching us. <clears throat> it can always get worse. Can always get worse. I think that when we look at the challenge right now of the choices on the table, there are no good choices. And what you want to do are the ones where you feel the strongest. And here it's a balance. I really do think of it as a balance. How do you get the people to be able to go home? This isn't telling them you have to go back. How you give them a sense of security, that means that Hezbollah is not there. If you arrive at a diplomatic uh, resolution, that Hezbollah moves because Hezbollah also doesn't want the war right now. And it means the threat stays, but it's delayed. People can go back home and then you can figure out something else. Again, different options on the table. I said before, 30% that, that it will be a war because we all have to remember, sometimes the war itself will start from the unexpected, okay? On July 12th, 2006, I was sitting at home and my husband called me and said, you won't believe it because I was already in this whole thing because of Gilad Shalit who had been kidnapped at the end of June. And he said, they just kidnapped and killed two additional soldiers from the north. I don't know that Hezbollah thinks the logical, rational, or more correctly, their logic and their rationale is different. And here I alone, I look at what they write in their English webpage online, the destruction of the Zionist entity. I think back to when I was at the prime minister's office during the uh, October 7th war with Hamas the first six months, and we were focusing very heavily and talking about Gaza, that was the immediate crisis that we were dealing with, even as this low-grade war, not really low-grade war, unfolded in the north. 
And I'm worried that we didn't do enough to prepare global opinion for what will happen in the North. We mentioned Hezbollah in every press conference, but if and when this happens, it will appear to come out of the blue. People won't understand the context. What do you think Israel has to start doing now so that if and when a war erupts, whoever begins the escalation for whatever strategic reasons, the world understands that this began with Hezbollah declaring war on Israel on October 7th, on October 8th, and that it is a terrorist organization backed by Iran, whose presence in southern Lebanon is illegal under international law, that has been pursuing a brutal war of aggression against the Israeli people, and that's why we're in this tragic situation. Um, very similar to the South, you're going to go, you already have on board governments. The governments will understand what you just said right now. The governments understand the threat of Hezbollah, what it means. They see it as a terror organization, even the French with all of the challenges that are there. International opinion is something else again. The street is something else again. Lebanon is a sovereign country. It is a failed country. It is a country that is in a free fall, but it's a sovereign country. And in that sense, one thing right now is putting it out there every single day. Um, and here, it's very challenging to change how media, let alone social media, trend on different things. Um, there's a war that's going on against Hamas in the South. It's not a happy one. It's an ugly one. And there is a war going on with Hezbollah in the North. And all I can say is that I, who have done also hundreds of interviews over the last six months, I'm one of the only people that ask me about Hamas in the South. I do not evade it, because that would be evasion. And then I say, can you also look at what's happening up North? Can you also look at what's happening up North? Remind it every single day, every single time. It is something that we need to bring out there. I think that actually the idea of spokesperson they put out every single day, but nobody posts it. You can't make them post it. I can't make them do that. Um, I would go out now much more and take um, um, regular and influencers. Oh my God, but you can't do that. You know how dangerous it is up north right now? You can't even take them to go do an article there and to shut with. That's how dangerous it is. Um, but we need to do it much more. And even then, I, I, I'm not saying we need to do so, and I still think that the street won't get it. So you have to convince the governments. Colonel Eisen, final question for you. Can you guess why I've chosen to wear these socks for today's podcast episode? There's a spider on them. There's a spider on them. What does a spider have to do with the theme of today's episode? This is Hassan Nasrallah's speech. Very from good. Which one? September of 2000. And, no, of, of 2000. It is a speech that he gave after Israel left Lebanon. I'm not going to be exact right now if I say it was in July or August to September of 2000. In that speech, Hassan Nasrallah defined Israel as being like a spider web that would fall apart because we are going to disintegrate into little pieces. Um, they are so wrong and they will continue to be wrong. He is wrong. He's very, he's like you and me, okay? We know how to talk, okay? It's about talk. You know, I happen to think Hassan Nasrallah is right. Because did you know, fun fact, that spider silk has five times the tensile strength of steel? I love it. And so I think it's a perfect metaphor to describe Israel's resilient society. Colonel Mary Eisen, thank you very much for joining me <laughs> on State of the Nation. Thank you so much, Elon. And that brings us to the end of today's rather daunting episode of State of a Nation, having a look at the northern threat from Hezbollah and what a third Lebanon war could potentially look like. If you enjoyed or found that episode informative, please do subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Give us a like, give us a nice rating, and share it with all your friends. Uh, as always, if you are in Israel, please follow the instructions of the Home Front Command. No need to panic, but important to exercise responsibility in dangerous times. I'm Elon Levy, and thanks for watching.